Hello everybody, Idre Reviews with Idre here. Take everything I say with a massive grain of salt, but today I'm doing a rare video. I haven't been uploading on this channel that much recently. But it is the end of the year, and in good old end of year tradition, I'm going to be presenting to you my top favorite albums of the year. Keep in mind, this is just my opinion. I don't go off any technical, like technicalities or anything like that. I get there's a lot of great musicianship out there across the board even in albums I might not personally enjoy. But these are just the albums that I personally really enjoyed. And for anybody that's new or didn't see my video last year, uh, the way I go about doing this is I take every album that I have heard this year um, that I would rate higher than a 7.5 or a 75 out of 100, depending on what scale you use, and then rank them accordingly. And this year, there were 28 albums that reached that eligibility for my personal liking. And, you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna probably go through the bottom few pretty quick. And then once I start getting to the top 20, and then eventually the top 10, I'm going to get a little bit more in depth and in detail. If you see me looking to the side over here, that's because I have my list with some notes already uh, pulled up for to, to get things uh, moving a little faster. So, let's get this started with number 28. The new Turnstile album, Glow On. Turnstile is a band that I wasn't really that familiar with uh, prior to this year, but their post-hardcore, well with dream pop infusion sound, or whatever you want to call it, was really infectious, great hooks, and great riffs, and just powerful, powerful post-hardcore songs. At number 27 is Quadeca's From Me To You. This He's known as a YouTuber more so than a rapper, or at least he was quite some time ago, but this album proves that even YouTubers can make great experimental and groundbreaking hip-hop albums. At 26 is the new 21 Pilots album, Scale and Icy. I do think that Scale and Icy is not on the same level as Trench, which came before it, and it doesn't reach the kind of euphoric highs that an album like Vessel has. It still is a great album that shows the band moving in a bit more of an indie pop direction, and quite honestly, they execute the sound very well. At 25, this shouldn't come as a surprise, is Dave Gone and Soul Savers' Imposter. This cover album from the frontman of Depeche Mode with his other group Soul Savers is once again another album I was bound to enjoy because it has the Depeche um, connection. And overall, I think the covers are really great, and the highlight to me on this album is his cover of Cat Power's Metal Heart. At 24 is the ever-changing St. Vincent, one of the most creative minds out there currently. This time she embraced a bit more of a 70s sound, but while still keeping the production as bombastic as ever and as fresh as ever. There's a lot of great innovative arrangements across this LP, and overall it is a great addition in St. Vincent's catalog. At 23, we have the brand new Tyler the Creator album, Call Me If You Get Lost. While I personally don't enjoy this album nearly as much as I enjoyed 2019's Igor, which is still, in my opinion, his magnum opus, Overall, this album is very much like a victory lap for Tyler, the creator. A lot of flexing on here. We're also a kind of undercurrent of breakup themes once again. And quite frankly, it makes perfect sense why he would be having a victory lap because Igor was a phenomenal album and is enough for anybody to have a victory lap. At 22 is the new Shame album, Drunk Tank Pink. This is an album from the UK post-punk outlet that, um... Doesn't sound all the most unique amongst all the other bands in this scene, but just their execution of this album to me was really, uh, really great. Shame is definitely a band functioning at their fullest and firing at all gaskets, so I recommend everybody checks out uh, Drunk Tank Pink. And at number 21, we have Jasmine Sullivan's Hotels, a really great thematic and conceptual R&B release with one of the with some of the best vocal performances I have heard in contemporary R&B in quite some time. All the songs tied together great. Pick Up Your Feelings is a phenomenal track, but so is Lost One, and Lost One might be one of the most heartfelt moments on the album and in R&B this year. And rounding off the top 20 at number 20 is the new Death From Above 1979 album, Is For Lovers. I actually wasn't sure if I was going to enjoy this album all that much because I have had a bit of a hard time getting into a lot of their material past their debut, but I actually felt that this was one of their strongest LPs. It's one of the most noise-inspired, one of the most just 
even though it is heavily compressed and really in your face, I feel like that kind of adds to the character of this album. The album is drowned in distortion and punching drums that really just make this, I think, one of the best noise rock albums I have heard this year. At number 19, hip hop legend Nas comes back with King's Disease 2. A great sort of throwback album while still sounding fresh as ever. Performances are great on this LP and a lot of the features really know uh, what they should be doing because they all add a lot to this LP as well. And while it isn't the most innovative hip hop album to come out this year, I do think it is proof that Nas is still as, you know, influential and as important as an artist as he was nearly 20, 30 years ago. At number 18 is the brand new Modest Mouse album, The Golden Casket, an album that I think has received an unjust amount of of criticism from fans and just music listeners alike. Well, it is a change in sound from some of their previous LPs. It still has a lot of that kind of uh, characteristics of Modest Mouse that I have loved up till this point. The sporadic guitar playing, the interesting arrangements, the kind of hectic, kind of all over the place uh, aspect that a lot of their albums have. And there are just certain songs on here that in my opinion are up with some of their greatest newer songs like We Are Between, and Wooden Soldiers, one of my personal favorites. Overall, Modest Mouse is still riding strong into this new decade, unlike what a lot of people seem to be saying. At number 17 is the brand new Church's album, Screen Violence. I first heard of this album through the single uh, How Not the Drowned with Robert Smith, which I loved immediately, but I actually kind of liked the other one a little more. He said, she said, a very, very infectious synth pop song, a synth pop banger that has pretty much been stuck in my head ever since I heard it. The album overall is a bit darker in tone and a bit more well-constructed than some of their previous albums, and it all comes together to make, I think, one of the best, if not the best, synth-pop album of 2021. Overall, I think Churches is a band that is showing a lot of improvement with each record, and um, yeah, everybody should check this out. And number 16 is Kanye West's Donda, an album that is probably my most listened to album this year, even though it's at number 16, purely because the highlights on this album are so damn good. Songs like Hurricane, Off the Grid, Moon, you name it, or I, I think are up there with some of Kanye's best. But overall, I mean, this album is a flawed record. It does have some low points on here. It is a very big album at over almost, I think, an hour and a half or something like that. It could have been cut in half, and it would have ranked so much higher on this list, unfortunately. But the highlights still keep this at a really high placement on this list because Kanye is still an important artist that is still pushing boundaries. And this sort of uh, album honoring his late uh, mother who passed away quite some time ago also still keeps a lot of the gospel influences that made Jesus is King such a unique album in his discography. But they are executed much better on Donda. You know, they aren't, they don't come across as rough around the edges as they do on Jesus is King. And overall, Donda is a much more focused record, even if it is a very flawed record. It is a solid album in Kanye's discography, and as somebody who appreciates the more experimental and weird side of Kanye West's music, there's a reason why Donda is on this list. At number 15 is Caro Caro Benito's Civilization. I understand this is technically a compilation of Civilization 1 and 2, the EPs that came out this year and a few years back, but it all comes together in a really good uh, album that is, once again, another solid addition to the Caro Caro Benito. Speaking of which, I just realized I have my little poster up of them. It's a great addition to their catalog. It kind of, in many ways, feels like a bit of a throwback to Benito Generation, their debut album, or um, their debut album, not mixtape which is my personal favorite. I love the very bubblegum-esque aspects of that LP, and that translates a lot over to Civilization. Although it is a bit more mature, it is a bit more um, well-written, I guess, like, mature-wise, but it, isn't, it doesn't hit me as hard as Benito Generation, but it is a great album that I think everybody should check out if you like some sort of uh, light-hearted, fun kind of synth-pop. Uh, Civilization is a great addition to the Caro Caro Benito catalog. 
At number 14 is the new Poppy album, Flux. If anybody remembered uh, my video from last year, uh, I loved I Disagree. I think that was a phenomenal album. I think that was Poppy's best album, and I still think it is Poppy's best album. Flux doesn't quite reach the level of I Disagree, in my opinion. It is a bit more straightforward. It kind of goes a bit more of a straightforward alternative rock and metal route with a lot less of that sort of theatrical pop side that Poppy had on I Disagree. But I can't deny the fact that the songs on this thing are executed very well. The opening track is one of the best songs, if not the best, alternative rock slash metal song I have heard all year. And just quite frankly, Poppy is an artist that is really kind of evolving and growing into this more alternative metal um, strain of music. And she's doing it really naturally and very well. And I really can't wait to see where Poppy evolves in the future because she is definitely on the right path. And at number 13, we have the new Arlo Parks album, Collapsed in Sunbeams. This is her debut album, and it's a phenomenal debut. And if I'm, if I'm thinking correctly, I'm pretty sure this is my favorite debut album to come out this year. It is a very bedroom pop, really mellow, really indie-inspired album. But overall, the songs are constructed well. The production is very kind of euphoric very personal and very kind of um, relaxing as well, but in a really soothing way that doesn't get boring. Her vocals are really great, and I think she's one of the best indie vocalists to come out of this year, and I really can't wait to see how she grows as an artist because this debut album is chock full of great bedroom pop songs that are, you know, that will get everybody in the feels. Songs like Hope are probably my favorite ones, although Hurt is great. Um, overall, great LP, great debut album. I really, really, really cannot wait to see where Arlo Parks um, grows in the coming years. Number 12, we have one of my personal favorite pop artists, Doja Cat with Planet Her. Um, I don't know what it is about Doja Cat. I just have a soft spot for her music. She's one of the most infectious pop artists out there currently, and her charm is as strong as ever on this album. Hot Pink is a great album and might be my personal favorite, but, you know, for some reason, her charisma makes almost everything she touches some of my favorite pop music out there right now. Well, I understand that there is just basic flaws on this album, like most pop albums out there today. It's full of bangers and has some of the most powerful pop vocals and even, like, rapping from, like, a female pop rapper that I have heard all year. And, I mean, in my opinion, right as of right now, Doja Cat is pretty unstoppable in the pop world. She's nominated for a lot of Grammys. This album was extremely successful, and for good reason. It is one of the best pop albums I have heard all year. Number 11, right before we get to the top 10, is the brand new Lingua Ignota album, Sinner Get Ready. This was a hard one for me to not put in the top 10, just because it is such a powerful album. She, Lingua Ignota has produced one of the most haunting albums once again, just like Caligula a few years back. But I will say, this album is nowhere near as in industrial and as... Uh, harsh on the noise as Caligula is, which is something that initially took me off guard and as somebody who appreciates industrial music made this album a little harder for me to warm up to. But it's more natural instrumentation and it's even hammering in uh, a little harder on the kind of uh, religious imagery, the Catholic imagery, and it all comes together with a really, really haunting delivery on her part with, once again, some of the most heart-wrenching and kind of hard to listen to vocal performances. Overall, she is definitely, she knows how to make some of the most uh, engaging music out there. Rounding off the top 10 is Martin Gore from Depeche Mode's EP, The Third Chimpanzee. Uh, once again, it's no surprise that a member of Depeche Mode's solo music would make it onto this list because I'm not kidding when I say Almost literally everything these guys do clicks with me. Uh, once again, he has released a great industrial-inspired EP that's instrumental that sort of takes a modern approach at a Depeche Mode sound that has sort of been gone for a little bit. You know, songs like uh, so songs like Mandrill, for example, would kind of give that classic throwback Depeche Mode feel, but I hear a lot of elements of the music that was present on albums like Spirit, which I love, on this EP, and overall it is an excellent execution of instrumental tracks from one of my favorite musical minds in general. 
Uh, I really hope that Martin brings some of this distorted electronic industrial sounds back to the Depeche Mode sound on whatever music they decide to come up with next, because this is definitely, I think, his one of his best solo albums or EPs I have heard in his entire career. At number nine, we have the Armed Ultra Pop. Another noise rock album. Noise rock is kind of on a rise this year, it feels like. This album definitely hurt my ears in the most great way possible. I mean, this is how a noise rock, a post-hardcore band should sound like. This album really never derails from its kind of point and from its purpose, and is just a pure block of white noise and sound, and it's the sound of a band operating at all gaskets, but... Don't get it twisted, even in the midst of the noise and the distortion, there is still great post-hardcore bangers on this album, and honestly the production on this album is kind of reminiscent of the early work of Waves. Um, if you've ever listened to the first two Waves albums, you'll know what I mean, they're very distorted, very lo-fi produced. Um, but the post-hardcore sound really makes this band really stick out amongst the rest of the noise rock crowd, and it clicks with me. It just clicks with me, and that's why it's in the top 10. At number 8, we have the brand new Japanese breakfast album, Jubilee. I just love the indie pop sound that Japanese breakfast has sort of tackled on this album, and I think she's tackled it best on this album than her other albums. The arrangements on this thing are killer, and her creativity really does seem to be at an all-time high. I really wish I was more familiar with her stuff before I had heard it, because going back and listening to some of her previous albums, I enjoy those a lot as well. But I really could safely say Jubilee is one of the best indie pop albums to come out all year. Songs like Be Sweet, Paprika are some of the best songs I have heard all year as well. Overall, great infectious pop sound. Everybody check out Japanese Breakfast's Jubilee. At number seven is one of the newest additions to this list is Lowe's Hey What. Uh, Lowe is a band that I really did not discover until a few months ago, and I'm so glad that I did because not only do I love this album, but I went back and I've pretty much loved all the other albums I have heard from them, including their Christmas album. Just putting it out there. But yeah, Hey What is kind of a big uh, change for them. It's definitely the sound of them moving away from some of their more slowcore roots, which I do love. Um, but embracing a bit of a post-industrial, harsh noise kind of sound, which once again, I do love. The post-industrial and even ambient kind of uh, distorted landscapes on this album really just are a nice contrast to the beautiful vocal performances that I hate using this word so much, but they are a little haunting at times. It's just, they're really well executed. The vocals are great. The instrumentation is great. Um, really, really engaging album. And at number six, we have Titans of Black Gaze, Death Heaven, with Infinite Granite. This is the sound of a band moving away from the sound that they are known for and embracing elements of their sound that have always been there, but never to the extent that they have on this album. Uh, Death Heaven, known for their kind of blend of black metal and shoegaze and dream pop, kind of hammer in on the shoegaze and dream pop on this album more so than any ever before, and I actually love it. Um, I wouldn't say it's as great as Sunbather, but they really embrace their roots and their shoegaze elements on this album, and it is a welcome change. And despite them going for a bit of a softer, bit of a lighter sound, uh, their performances are just as grand as you know, epic and engaging as they were when they were making some more of their metal stuff. And if anything, all Infinite Granite proves to me is that Def Heaven is one of the most versatile and creative bands out there in metal and in alternative rock. And their ability to switch up and embrace other elements of their sound so fluidly and almost flawlessly is something that I really enjoy and definitely proves that they are great artists. And rounding off the top five is actually the new Killers album, Pressure Machine. Last year, when Imploding the Mirage came out, I was actually a little disappointed. I was not that impressed with Imploding the Mirage. It was a good album, but it felt like it was just kind of relying on the stereotypes that they had already set for themselves. But on Pressure Machine, I think this is the Killers' best album since Hot Fuss, hands down. 
the sort of Americana infused sound of this album is a welcome change and definitely just like Def have improved that they are able to tackle different sounds greatly. And um, it's nowhere near as forgettable as their previous LP and lyrically, conceptually and production wise, this is like them at their best. Uh, Flower, Brandon Flower's vocals on this album are phenomenal, and some of his most raw and passionate vocals I have really heard him on since probably Sam's Town or Day and Age. And uh, the stripped back production, the very acoustic orientation, uh, sort of Springsteen-esque sound of this album is something I like. And this is coming from somebody that actually doesn't even like the vast majority of Springsteen's catalog, but I really do think that they tackle this sound so good. The sort of themes of his small town that he grew up in really fit the Americana sound of this album quite well. And honestly, West Hills is by far, I think, the best album opener I have heard all year. It is such a su such an emotionally uh, great song. Overall, Pressure Machine is, I think, Killer's greatest album since Hot Fuss. And at number four is the best hip-hop album of the year, in my opinion, and that is JPEG Mafia's LP. Uh, I've always enjoyed Peggy's work, but never to the level that I have quite enjoyed this album. This is simply experimental cloud rap at its finest. As hectic and schizophrenic as this album is, and kind of as schizophrenic as Donda as well, it's much more, it doesn't have the room for filler because every single track on here is short to the point and like I said, it doesn't have room for filler. It hits you hard, it hits you in the face and this is just classic Peggy at his weirdest, at his most experimental and at his best. The wide array of sounds and influences on this album come together in just sonic bliss and it just feels like a grand artistic statement tied together by insanity and is definitely Peggy's Yeezus in some sense and I just feel like I was not expecting this album to be nearly as great as it was but it really is the offline version is just as good if not better as the version you will find on streaming um so yeah JPEG Mafia's LP is definitely one of the greatest albums I've heard this year landing at number four at number three, we have Julian Baker's Little Oblivions, probably the best indie folk album to come out this year. Definitely the Punisher of this year as well. Uh, she continues to be one of my favorite singer-songwriters in indie right now, and Little Oblivions, I think, is her best album yet. By bringing in a whole band with much more lush arrangements than just the previous her and a guitar sound that was on her previous albums, I actually think added a lot to her sound, dis despite what Fantano might say. And the lyrics are only amplifying this sound in many ways, with, with themes of her addiction as well. Definitely kind of um, make it a, a very personal and heartfelt record for me. Uh, she writes music from the heart, which is something that I resonate with, and she writes just great indie songs. And then the spectacular, really luscious production only kind of amplifies that as well. This really makes me want to see her work with Phoebe Bridgers again with Boy Genius, and um, yeah. At number two, I have Idols Crawler, a band that I thought had reached their peak last year with Ultramano. A uh, phenomenal post-punk album that was probably, up to that point, my favorite album in their career, and yet they managed to top it with Crawler. Much more, I think, diverse of an album, much more mellow at times as well, bringing in much more synths in the mix, much more slower strong song structures into the mix, and yet their sound still remains as on edge as it was prior. They are still spearheading the punk movement into the 2020s, and for the second year in a row, I mean, they have landed pretty high on my list. The tone of this album, I feel like, is actually much darker and has quite a few introspective and toned-down moments, which is something I quite like. I've always appreciated it when a band does that, and they do it quite well. I think the vocalist of this group is also shining much better now that he's doing some of these more introspective, softer songs rather than the more aggressive side that he is known for. But don't don't get it twisted, there are some energetic, fast-paced, hardcore songs on this album as well that prove that they still have their punk credibility. Overall, Idols is a killer band that really blew it out of the water with Crawler, and 
Um, yeah, if they could keep this up, they could easily be one of the greatest groups of the 2020s. And at the number one spot is Wolf Alice's Blue Weekend. What a phenomenal indie rock album, or alternative rock, whatever you want to call it. One of the most consistent albums I have heard of all time. It is conceptually one of the best albums I have heard of all time. And uh, the sound of this album is just is is great. I mean, it takes a lot of those elements of the 90s alternative rock that I personally like, but kind of puts it in a much more modern sense that doesn't feel nearly as dated. And the result is just a phenomenal album. Every little bit of this album is just so well-rounded and constructed that it ranks amongst the greats in the genre of all time. You know, the album's consistent themes and well-laid-out track list make this more of an experience than it does an album, and the series of music videos for nearly every single song definitely makes it more of a movie as well. It's so cinematic at times. Uh, this is their best album without a doubt. This album is also just a great representation of the art of the album, the art of the LP. It's not just a collection of solid tracks. It has a classic album layout from front to finish, and it is just simply a must-hear album. Wolf Alice hit it out of the park with uh, by far my favorite album this year. Everybody needs to check it out. And with that, that finishes my top, I guess, 28 albums of 2021. Great year for music, what can I say? A lot of great albums came out this year. Well, I didn't have any albums like last year that I gave a 100 to, last year being the 1975. Um, a lot of great music from a wide array of genres, a wide array of styles. Uh, great year for music. I could only hope 22 is equally as great, and I'm sure it will be because every year has great music you just have to look for it and with that being said that is all i have for you today um this channel is pretty dead these days i am pretty active on album of the year so if you want to um album of the year org if you want to find me and see what my musical opinions are for not only new albums but classic albums as well you can go over to album of the year org at idre the depeche head i think it's kind of self-explanatory um, yeah, this list is also on there with some more in-depth writing that I put on it. Uh, yeah, that's all I have to say, and goodbye to next year.